Hello, welcome to this video on capacitors. Uh, this video is the first um, upload on my new um, YouTube channel. Uh, I've decided to split my YouTube uh, account, so all of the uh, educational stuff is going to come into this channel, which is Mystery Science, and the Pokemon stuff is going to stay Mystery Opens Pokemon, and there's also going to be um, a channel for me to just kind of tinker around with um, editing and and stuff. It's going to be some weird and wonderful stuff. I'm calling it, calling that mystery inspires uh, or mis oh no mystery inspirations. There we go. That that sounds much better. Okay, so this video is intended for the year twelves um, who are currently in lockdown um, and possibly very possibly coming back to school soon um, in some form or another but hey who knows what the future will bring so uh, just a little back, bit of background um, for those of you who are not my year 12 students um, the year 12s have just completed uh, electric fields um, and no discussion of electric fields is complete without finishing it finishing off with um, a look at capacitance um, so they are doing the edXL A-level course um, we're currently in year 13 content and we finished their content a while ago. Uh, the next thing I upload is going to be a, a revision session for them for uh, some year 12 uh, content just to keep things fresh. So that's a little background on where we are. Uh, let's crack on with some actual capacitance. So what we're going to do today is I'm just going to read the objectives to you. I mean, they're on the screen for you, but um, objective 116 is understand that capacitance is defined as C equals Q over V, where C is capacitance, Q is charge and V is voltage or potential difference and be able to use this equation. Uh, objective 117, be able to use the equation for the energy stored by a capacitor. Be able to derive the equation from the area under a graph of potential difference against charge stored and be able to derive and use the equations hopefully at the end of this video uh, you should be able to do that or at least have the tools to begin thinking about that which is what a level physics is all about so we have to start by thinking about current in a wire why does current flow in a wire now uh, the year 12s you would already have seen uh, this in Miss um, Kennedy's uh, PowerPoint yesterday um, and so that hopefully they should have thought about the answers to these questions but we've got to think about these things what is needed for a current to flow what happens if there's a gap in a circuit and if there is, will the electrons still feel a force? So let's imagine um, we're an electron inside a circuit. The electrons inside a metal, we're metallically bonded. We're a sea of delocalized electrons. We're free to move around the conduction band of all of the positive ions around us. And we're moving randomly until all of a sudden, um, a potential difference, an electric field is set up around um, a circuit and we feel a force, we feel a pull towards a positive plate and we feel a repulsion from uh, the negative uh, terminal of a power supply. So trying to imagine this without using the terms feel, um, only in terms of feeling a force, um, lots of uh, people when they're trying to explain this try to talk about whether electrons know something or they don't they don't know anything um, unless you want to talk about quantum entanglement and that is a completely whole new board game and we don't want to talk about that i just said board game i meant ball game um, so we have this potential difference we now have uh, work being done on the circuit uh, charges are now moving uh, the electrons are moving away from the negative terminal and towards the positive terminal so 
This is all well and good, but what happens if there's a gap in the circuit? Now, we know that if we break a circuit, the electricity cannot flow, the electrons cannot move. Um, but do they still feel a force? Now, if the break in the circuit is still close together, the answer is yes. We've, we've just learned about electric fields. If the wires are thin enough, that break, if it's close enough together, is, is uh, a two point charges. So you have an electric field set up around the, the, the wires. So electrons will flow towards the end of the wires initially. Um, however, once they get there, they can't move, they can't cross the gap. And so they stop because then they repel all the other electrons on the other side of it. And we know that if we put those two wires closer together um, without them touching, you will eventually get them so close where the electric field will break down um, the, the, the air and you will have electricity flowing and cause a, a, a spark. This is called arcing. Um, so we know that these electric fields exist and we know that we can force uh, electricity to pass through uh, a gap in a circuit. But if the gap is big enough, we can set up an electric field and not allow the electricity to flow, but there will be a potential difference between the gap in the circuit. So this leads us on uh, to a capacitor. So what is a capacitor? Now I've left the um, circuit symbol for a capacitor there, and that might give you some idea of what a capacitor is. If you can imagine the thin lines, uh, or horizontal lines are the wires, they're connected to two plates and there is a gap in the circuit. So it's a pair of plates, uh, conductive plates, that are separated by an insulator. It could be an air gap, but it's normally uh, some sort of dielectric material to insulate, to stop electricity or electrical charges flowing from one plate to another, because you're gonna set up a potential difference across these plates. So here we are, there's a diagram of uh, the charges moving uh, around the circuit. What you're going to end up with are positive charges on one plate, negative charges, on another plate. As the uh, current moves around, the example I gave about the wire, the charges will stop moving pretty quickly because there is uh, a couple of electrons uh, repelling all the other electrons uh, from the ends of the wire. In these plates, in these normally thin foils uh, with dielectric material in between them, and then wrapped around, actually rolled up like a Swiss roll and stuffed in a, a small cap to make electrical component. But these conductive foils give the charges enough room to kind of store themselves um, onto the plates. And this gives a buildup of charge. So you end up with a positive charge on one side where all the electrons have fled away from and a negative charge on the other where all of the electrons have arrived. Now, eventually, you're going to start building up a potential difference across these plates. As soon as the potential difference across the plates is equal to the potential difference of the power supply, the charge must stop flowing. Work has to be done to get these charges onto the plates. As soon as the work, um, as soon as, sorry, as soon as the potential difference is the same across the battery and the um, capacitor, no work can be done anymore. Okay, we're now at a saturation point where the negative charges on the capacitor are going to repel the negative charges in the wire. So what do we use capacitors for? We use capacitors for storing charge. We can now put electrons onto one side of the plate. We have an absence of electrons of the, on the other, so you have metal ions that's stuck on the other plate, and this creates a potential difference. These charges um, become trapped. Now, what tends to happen is you tend to charge up your uh, capacitor, and then you disconnect it from the power supply. Uh, and then we've got this trapped charge then, 
um, on the capacitor. So it becomes fully charged, that should say, when the potential difference equals that of the power source. Okay? That, it, we cannot charge it any more than the total potential difference that we put into the capacitor. So the amount of charge a capacitor can store per volt, so it's the amount of charge per volt uh, applied across it, is its capacitance, and it's measured in coulombs per volt. Okay, the SI unit for coulombs per volt is farads, so we measure the capacitance in farads. So capacitance is how much charge we can get onto the uh, capacitor per unit volt of potential difference across it. We know that as soon as the potential across the plates is equal to the potential from the uh, power supply, you cannot get any more charge on it. But the amount of charge you can get on there at that point is the capacitance. Okay. So this means we can uh, have a little equation Capacitance measured in farads is equal to the charge stored measured in coulombs divided by the potential difference across the capacitor in volts or C equals Q over V. Now this is going to become important later on. Okay, so as always, uh, if you are working through this video, uh, I'd like you know to pause the video and have a go at these two questions. The first one. What is the capacitance of a capacitor which can store 18 millicoulombs of charge when the potential difference across it is 6 volts? Okay. And then how much charge will be stored on this capacitor if the voltage is increased to 20 volts? Okay. So it's just using that equation and then rearranging. All right. So we use our equation C equals Q of V. Capacitance is charge divided by voltage. The charge in this case is 18 millicoulombs. The potential difference is 6 volts. So that's 1.8 times 10 to the minus 4 divided by 6, which gives you 3 times 10 to the minus 3 farads, or 3 millifarads. Now, capacitance is 1 farad is actually pretty huge. We tend to measure uh, capacitances in microfarads. Um, or millifarads, three millifarads is quite large. How much charge will be stored in this capacitor if the voltage is increased to 20 volts? Well, now we just simply rearrange the equation. The amount of charge is equal to the capacitance multiplied by the voltage, um, the potential difference across the plates. So now we have three times 10 to the minus three, three microfarads, uh, multiplied by, sorry, I'm saying microfarads, I mean millifarads. Um, Three, sorry, three millifarads multiplied by 20 volts, which gives us 60 millicoulombs or 0 0.006 coulombs. Right. So because we're charging, uh, we're sorry, we're storing charges uh, on these plates. This means uh, they must hold electrical potential energy. We're creating a potential difference across the um, the plates and that means they have the potential to do work they can do electrical work so they're holding energy they're storing energy and that's what a capacitor does we charge them up they store the energy for later use now we know that if something has a constant charge and a constant voltage I'll work on electrical circuits before uh, yields that the energy uh, is of the of a circuit is the charge multiplied by the potential difference. Okay, so that's the energy of a circuit, but that's only for constant charges, constant voltages. Now, if you look at this graph of potential difference against charge, this is for a capacitor. The capacitor starts at zero um, volt, uh, volt, zero charge, and you have to increase the voltage uh, to get more charge onto the capacitor. So this means that our energy is given as a half QV. So a half times the charge versus uh, multiplied by voltage. 
And you can see that because it's the area under this graph. The area under this graph is a triangle. And so you have half times base times height. So that's half times the charge multiplied by the potential difference. If we had um, a constant charge and constant voltage, we would have a rectangle there. We could just take the area of that rectangle. So moving on from this, uh, the energy is uh, given as a half uh, charge times voltage. But since we've already discussed that uh, charge is equal to capacitance multiplied by voltage, we can now substitute charge into that equation. If you substitute CV into the equation above, you're going to end up with a half times Q times, uh, sorry, a half times C times V times V, which is a half CV squared. Okay. But also, if you rearrange that equation, voltage is given, or sorry, potential difference is given as charge divided by capacitance. So V equals Q over C. Again, if you substitute that back into this equation, you have E equals a half uh, Q times Q divided by C, Q half QC divided by C. Okay. So again, what I'd like you to do again is pause the video and have a quick look at this. What is the energy stored? on a charged 100 microfarad capacitor, which has three millicoulombs of charge. All right, so to start this, we have to remember um, our units. So 100 microfarads is 100 times 10 to the minus six, or one times 10 to the minus four. Um, three millicoulombs is three times 10 to the minus three. Um, so if we pop that into this equation, uh, you end up with a half, three times 10 to the minus three squared, divided by 100 times 10 to the minus six. And that gives you an energy of 0 0.045 joules. Okay. All right, so I want to leave you with these questions. Um, these are the questions that if you are in my year 12 group, I'd like you to have a go at these. Um, and submit them along with your notes either to my email address or to my uh, or up to share my homework um, and that is uh, these questions what is the capacitance of a capacitor which stores two coulombs of charge for every 100 volts applied to it a 0 0.01 farad capacitor is charged by and then isolated from an 8 volt power supply and this is quite normal uh, you would see uh, questions in the exam where you would have a capacitor normally with a, uh, a two-way switch um, which can either be off uh, or uh, switch to position A where um, a capacitor will be charged by a power supply and then it, when it's switched to uh, position B it can then discharge through a different part of the circuit switch uh, will then isolate it from the power supply. So calculate the charge stored. Um, then if you connect this capacitor uh, across another identical capacitor, uh, which is uncharged, describe and explain what will happen to the charge on each capacitor. So really think about what's happening with the charges on those capacitors. Uh, how much energy is stored on a 50 microfarad capacitor, which is charged to 12 volts? And then slightly more tricky as always at the end, a 1200 microfarad capacitor is connected to a voltage supply until fully charged with 10.8 millicoulombs. If this capacitor is then disconnected, and reconnected across a 10 watt light bulb, how long could the capacitor light the bulb for? Okay, so have a go at those. Uh, I'll do uh, worked um, solutions to these um, on a separate video, uh, hopefully in the next couple of days. Um, so just thank you for watching. Um, at this point, I would normally uh, put uh, end screens into here, uh, which will show you uh, the videos that you can see. 
And that's not going to happen until uh, more videos are uploaded onto this channel. Um, but so if you're seeing videos here, click them, please, uh, and subscribe, uh, like the, uh, the the video, please. Uh, give us give us a little like, subscribe, and comment uh, down below. Tell us what you liked and what you didn't like. Uh, how can I improve these videos for you? Are they useful to you? Um, what stage are you at in your A-level career? Are you revising? Um, are you coming into A-levels? Let me know so I can tailor my content to the people who are watching. All right, uh, stay safe and I'll see you soon.